Stan was uh, a complicated person, and you know, like Jude Sims said, there's a bunch of bunch of nice guys. Uh, uh, Stan and I got friendly for one particular reason. That is, I was an admirer of his. Who wasn't? I mean, he, saxophone genius. My father, who uh, in one of his incarnations. Uh, my father was really primarily a novelist, but he'd been a journalist in his younger days, and he uh, covered uh, uh, the arts for a major German newspaper out of Vienna, and wrote about music, which he was very good at. He was a, in his youth, he played cello. Uh, he uh, covered film, he covered uh, uh, all the arts, and, but uh, it, I got him interested. He was not, not in, in, inimical to jazz at all. Uh, he had had to be written a little bit about some jazz-related things in the 20s. Uh, not real, but something like the Revelers. Uh, he didn't like the king of jazz. He, was, he hated the collar. He didn't like the collar. Anyway, uh, I took him to see Stan Getz, and it didn't take, you know, Hadn't played for more than 30 seconds, he said, turned to me, he said, the man is a virtuoso, you know, he said, the man. He said command of the instrument. But Stan was, was a complicated guy. Uh, I got to like him very much, but we became friends for a very kind of simple reason, which is that when Stan came back from a long spell in Europe, and I spent uh, quite a few years primarily in Sweden, he married a, a Swedish woman. And uh, uh, when he came back to New York, you know, his arrival, uh, it, it, this was still at a time when people came in on ships, you know, so uh, uh, it was announced, it had been announced to the press, I guess. I was with Metronome, it was in my beginning days at Metronome. And so, said, hey, Stan's coming back, and you know, I want to come down and, and greet him. I was the only, I can't curse, well, I was the only effing journalist who came, whether jazz or anything, I was the one who came to see him, and he never forgot that, he never forgot that. After that, we were friends, and uh, I, got, uh, I, I got to hang with Stan quite a bit, uh, once I became editor of Downbeat, then I had to go to Chicago, which at first I didn't want to do, but then I, find I got to like Chicago a lot, and there were many nice people there, including Harriet Choice, which we have talked about. Uh, so I got to hang with Stan quite a bit and uh, saw various sides of him, uh, which uh, included you know, the wonderful session he did for Jimmy Rolls, and uh, uh, never heard Stan play even anything that I would consider halfway, but I mean, he was always, always at his best, sometimes really, you know, outstanding, but never anything but great. Uh, but I remember a couple of, uh, you, you like this story, the London House in Chicago, uh, was a great place because it was a first-class restaurant as well as a jazz club. It was an unusual combination. It was run by the Marienthal brothers, George Marienthal was there. Anyway, uh, the bandstand was, uh, you know, as it usually is, at one side of the club, and uh, uh, the tables where people were dining uh, were just below the bandstand, and it was, uh, you know, so anyway, uh, Stan was opening, I was always downbeat, I was invited on opening nights, and they had a special corner section where they had uh, the press, you know, and they treated us very well. We'd, uh, uh, it was noted for steaks in particular, but they had wonderful roast beef and a real great salad dressing they called Green Guys. Anyway, Stan, here is opening night. So there is a party right in front, front table, 
Uh, if I remember correctly, four people, two couples, they talk, and they talk loudly. They're drinking, they're eating, they're talking. Stan, very politely, after the first number or so, he said, would you please be a little quiet? No reaction. No reaction. They continue to talk, and as they have more to drink, they get a little louder. Stan, finally, he's had it. You know what he does? He sticks out one leg, foot, out of the bandstand, down to the table, and steps right on one of the plates full of steak. Boom, like that. It's a wonderful gesture, but <laughs> not necessarily appreciated by the management. <laughs> but actually, they kept him on for the rest of his day and threw the party out. <laughs> so I didn't, they didn't have to pay that check and they had out of there. So that was, that was something, right. you know, kind of unique. Um, Stan, uh, when we was in Chicago, when they were at the London House, and another engagement, uh, they came to, uh, had a nice big apartment in Chicago, and they came to the house and played some records and stuff, and uh, he had Chick Corea with him, his Chick was in his band, uh, and he had a habit of, he called Chick, Chicky Baby, and Chick didn't like that. <laughs> But Stan knew that he didn't like it, but he called him that anyway. Uh, so no, we, we, we actually hung out, we went to the wedding, we went to, you know, in Chicago, you could go to the beach where I lived, there was like one block away from the lake there, which is like having a beach right near your house in the middle of the city. We went swimming. So Stan was quite, he was in very good shape in spite of the fact of all the things that he did to himself. And, uh, that, you know, uh, the way he, he dealt with his final illness was, was, was remarkable. And the way he played near the end, you know, he always played well, but, but he and Kenny Barron, uh, God, I saw them together. That was the last time I saw Stan and uh, uh, went uh, backstage and I went to the dressing room to see him. and. Uh, uh, I, I think the way he, he dealt with that uh, was something that would show people who tended to, you know, put him down and think of him as a, some kind of, you know, bad guy or whatever. He wasn't. You have to remember about Stan that he was obviously a genius musician. That he got, you know, he started out, he played the bassoon, he had a scholarship. and it, He was like 15, 16 years old when he went on the road with Jack Teagarden. Mm -hmm. And Jack was his, uh, you know, uh, he had to sign papers, it was his guardian. Now, Jack Teagarden, I loved Jack, but he wasn't going to be anybody's guardian. <laughs> and he was a heavy drinker. So, you know, that was his, uh, you know, uh, that was the way he started his, you know, education in life. I, you, you would like this, to, but you probably know it. You know why he left Stan Kenton. Why did Stan leave I don't Stan remember. Kenton? They had an argument. Stan Kenton didn't like Lester Young, so the talker. Stan quit. <laughs> Stan liked the Vita Busso school channel, you know, big tones on it. But that was enough for Stan to leave the band. <laughs> he loved Lester. There's a photo of the two where, where, where you can see the way Stan looks at Lester, you know, how much he loved him. But he was no copycat. He was a total original. Uh, to me, you know, uh, you don't need John Coltrane who said, you know, we'd still play like that if we could, you know. Uh, the man was a, he, he was a genius musician. But uh, late, late in life, he, he called me and, uh, told me that he had been asked to uh, teach a, a, a course uh, at Stanford and he said, uh, you know, he said, Dan, I said, how can I do that? I, I didn't even finish high school, you know, how am I going to talk to these students? I said to him, come on, 
you are staying guts. You have things that you can tell them that nobody else could. You're question, don't be, but, but, but he was so, uh, you know, uh, really, uh, I was amazed at uh, how, you know, the humility, you know, that the fact that he didn't have an education and that he was, so, you know. Uh, I liked Stan very much. I, uh, uh, he was the only one, the only blindfold test I ever did. I wanted to do a blindfold test with him for the, the, the for the and so I did one with him, and, and it was fun to do. One of the things I played for him was the only solo I know that he ever recorded on alto with a studio thing that was called Mills Blue Rhythm Band at the time, and he, he didn't recognize it at first, but then he did. And, uh, uh, he really was, I mean, he's one of my favorite musicians, and uh, you know, he was remarkable. Just his sound, yeah. you know, but what he could do. There's a thing called Parker 51, which is a fast Cherokee, and he had that wonderful group with Tiny Khan, who was one of the great drummers. Also could arrange and everything. I fast Cherokee. Wow. I think of the other side, which is the gets I love is uh, from Focus against the Eddie Sorter. And just. Well, Focus is, you know, it, it, it's a work of genius because all that Sorter did was to write something that Stan would have to play on top of. There yeah. wasn't anything written out for him. No, I know. But his sound and yeah. the, the interplay between himself and the orchestra is amazing. Yeah. 